most of you who have been in church for any period of time heard this verse. You've probably heard it preached a few hundred times, possibly. Uh, it's a very well-known verse. And it's the verse that is most commonly associated with revival, probably many verse in the Bible. And most people, if you say, what's a prescription in the Bible for revival? Uh, most cases, they will bring this verse up. And I want to touch upon this verse just a little bit tonight in, kind of in, 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 in context of what we've been speaking about, what we've been doing in the church as of lately, in the last month or so, with the focus on seeking God. And this is one of the scriptures that you would very normally come to in that context. In the setting here, what has taken place is they have just dedicated the temple. And they have just dedicated the temple, and God has just filled the temple up with the glory. And this is the, the passage of Scripture where we find that, you know, the priests couldn't enter in because the temple was filled up with the glory of God. And they couldn't stand and minister because the temple was filled up with the glory of God. And then God is speaking to them, and God is saying, go to this verse and says, Now, if all of this kind of goes steady, if you reach the point to where everything seems to be dry, if you reach the point to where this isn't the case anymore, and the glory is not here. This is what you do. And he went on into this verse. And 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, he said, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And so that, in many ways, in that context was exactly that. That was, in a sense, a prescription for revival. If things are not like they're supposed to be, if things are no longer like this, where the temple is filled up with the glory, this is what you are to do. And I just want to touch upon it a little bit tonight. I'm not going to do a, a, a big, long teaching or anything on this scripture. But there's a couple of things that I want to bring to our attention. One of the first things that really struck me, as I just kind of went going back to this, and I've preached on this verse many times, and over the years, and, you know, most of us have, especially if we get into any kind of uh, revival type of ministry, this is one we commonly went to. But one of the things I want to draw to our attention is the order that it lists things here. Because I found it pretty fascinating in the order of things here. If my people, which are called by my name, shall first of all humble themselves, second of all pray, thirdly seek my face, and fourthly turn from their wicked ways. Now, why do I find that order so fascinating? Because I think in most of our thinking, we would reverse that. In most of our thinking, if we would say, what do we need to do for revival? We would say, well, the first thing we need to do is turn from our wicked ways. The first thing we need to do is maybe we need to have a time of repentance and just turn our hearts back to the Lord, but that's the last thing listed. I thought, Lord, that's kind of fascinating. Why would that be last? Why would the first thing be, the first thing be humble ourselves? And I began to think, I thought, well, that makes sense. If we humble ourselves, if we truly humble ourselves, as I'm going to teach you why, then we were going to pray. And if we're truly going to have a life of prayer, then we're going to seek God's face. And if we truly seek His face, then something's going to happen at that point. You see, because if we go back to the Scriptures, we can think of Isaiah chapter 6, when the prophet Isaiah beheld the glory of God, what was his response? Woe is me, I am a man undone with unclean lips. So we see that that's kind of that process there, isn't it? You see, we humble ourselves and pray. And when we enter into a time of prayer out of our humility, then we'll begin to seek God's face. And then when we begin to seek God's face, something might happen. We might see that face, so to speak. We might see the manifestation of the glory of God. And when we see the manifestation of the glory of God, we're going to respond like the prophet Isaiah surely did when he says, Woe is me, I am undone. If I'm telling you, if we behold the glory of God, we're going to want to let go of our wicked ways. It's the revelation of who God is and the goodness of God and the glory of God that leads us to turn away from our wicked ways. So that order makes perfectly good sense. Because we like to turn that around and think, well, we've got to turn our wicked ways away turn away from our wicked ways, to earn the presence of God. But it's the presence of God that causes us to lay down our wicked ways. It's the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. And so it makes perfectly good 
sense in that order. You see, I think we could easily have just as read it also and said, if uh, shall humble themselves and pray, shall humble themselves and seek his face, shall humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways. I think the humbling ourselves ties us right into all the rest of them. And as I thought about that, I, I began to really think about humility. And just a, a couple of things that I, I've discussed with a couple of people here lately that just came out in, in my talk and conversation with people about prayer and seeking God lately. You know, I remember the quote that was given by, I think it was Heidi Baker, when she went first went to Mozambique and began to minister there among the people who were in just total poverty and devastation. And, and when, she, when she went there, she was taking, telling those people, she says, you know, I, I feel so far sorry for you because you guys have nothing. And her response is, well, no, we feel sorry for you. Because you'll never know what it is to totally, totally depend entirely upon God for everything. Because you already have too much. I thought, wow, you know, I don't know. It, 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 I've ever been in a place where I've had to depend upon God for everything. I mean, where I've really had to just absolutely be relying upon God. And if God don't come through and don't move miraculously, I'm not going to have nothing to eat tomorrow. But it takes a miracle to have food. You see, that's a place of dependence and humility upon God. And, and I think it was me and Rachel were talking one day, and I don't remember what we were talking about now. And I, I was talking about, you know, reading some of the, the diaries and the journals and the things that were written during the time of the Azusa Street <coughs> And I said, you know, it, it was amazing to me. And, and, and there's something about it that, that is kind of intriguing when you read in somebody's diary how they had to pray and, and believe God for an ink pen to continue writing. There's something that we have, you know, so much access to that we have, you know, probably hundreds and thousands of access to them, but they were in a place in life to where they had to depend upon God to perform a miracle to have meat and the right. I thought, that's kind of humility. You see, true humility is when we really understand that even though we may have material things that seem to tell us otherwise, but we are absolutely dependent upon God for everything. And that is humility. And, and humility is not us beating ourselves up and thinking, well, I'm such a bomb and so I'm such a, a lowly thing, you know, I'm just a piece of dirt. A lot of people think that's humility. That's not humility. Humility is found when I realize His glory and His goodness and His love and His mercy and His grace and how absolutely 100% dependent I am upon Him is humility. You see, beloved, if we humble ourselves, if we truly realize how much we are wholly and completely dependent upon the Lord, then obviously we enter into a life of prayer. I'll guarantee you those people who, have, who are wondering whether or not their next bill will be there and know they need a miracle to see it, you have no trouble coaching them to spend some time in prayer today. Those people who are, are in a place who are dependent upon God to, to, to miraculously move so they can have an, an ink pen. You probably don't have any battles getting them to pray. But you see, beloved, whether we realize it or not, we're dependent upon God for all things. And that's truly what humility is. I remember a while back, and a couple of illustrations you've heard me use before. But it helps us understand humility, I think. And I remember years ago one time, and, and I was, and this was long before we were in this building, and, and I was in a worship service, and just praising God, and just worshiping Him. And it was just one of those services, and it was, it was really special how God was moving. And I went home that night, and I was just, you know, all just praise God in His presence. And I woke up the next morning, and I still just felt the presence of God so strong. And I began to talk to the Lord, and the Lord, that, that's just beautiful. And the Lord began to speak to me then, and he said, Mike, the way you were in that service, I want you to think about it for a moment. Do you realize how you were in that service, and you were in that worship service, and you were just so attentive to me, and you were just listening for my voice, and, and just totally surrendered to me, and waiting for me to lead you and guide you with my spirit. And I said, yes, Lord, he says, that's how I want you to live your life. Every moment of every day. That's humility. Humility is depending upon the voice of God to, to, to know how to move and, and how to function and what do you desire of me today. Humility is, is looking to the Lord tomorrow morning and saying, Lord, I, I need you to lead me and guide me through this day. Lord, I'm 
entirely dependent upon your hand, Father God. I'm entirely dependent upon your voice to lead me and guide me throughout the day. Humility is realizing we're dependent upon the Lord even for the breath we breathe. Humility is realizing I'm dependent upon the Lord for my heart to beat. Humility is that place of dependence upon the Lord. I, I've often used the, the illustration, and, and, and forgive me for using it again, I'm sure you guys know it, but let's just think about it for a moment. You know the illustration where I play the, the state champion in chess? Have you heard that before? Yeah, I don't remember that. I was asking the, the decisions, is if I was to play the state champion in chess, and I like how you guys have no, no, no confidence in me at all, uh, how many of you think I would win? See, all you, you do, I said, oh, no way, you're not going to beat the state champion in chess. You ain't never seen me play chess, have you? You're hard work. Oh, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, if I was going against the state champion, probably the odds yeah, are probably against me, right? I'm not saying that I, you know, couldn't win one out of a hundred, and that might be that one, but uh, chances are that whoever that state champion is, is probably going to beat me. And most of you are going to say, well, you're not going to, you, you're not going to vote that I'm the winner in that matchup, are you? In most cases, you're not. Now, and I always use the illustration, whoever the world champion is at chess, well, if he was sitting at my side, and he says, Mike, I'm going to tell you each move to make. Now, all of a sudden, chances are just, my eyes just went up, didn't they? How do you think now that the world champion sitting beside me telling me every move to take, that I probably beat that state champion? Yeah. I probably do, don't I? As long as I'm humble enough, as long as I'm humble enough, to listen to him and make his moves. Now, but there's an issue here. I could get proud. And I could be watching that state champion play me like that stuff right there, do it. I think I can beat him, or her, whatever the case may be. I think I can beat him. And the, and the world champion says, move this up. No, no, wait a minute, I got this. I'm gonna handle this all by myself. I got this. I can handle this dude. He's going down and I'm going to beat it myself. You see, that's what happens to us in life. You see, we have God's word and we have God's spirit. And he's, and he's there whispering in our ear telling us every move to make if we want to listen to him. His word, he said his word to lead and guide us. He gave us his word to teach us how to live our life. And if we just simply are humble enough to listen to him, then we're okay. But what happens is we do like that in the chess game and we get proud and say, okay, Lord, I got this one all by myself. Lord, I might need you tomorrow, I might need you the next week, but I'm okay here. I, 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 I got this one. You see, the humility, the great model of humility was Jesus. Go to John chapter 5, verse 19. I'm going to walk you through a few scriptures tonight. John chapter 5, verse 19. And notice what Jesus says here. John 5, 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Very, very, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, he also doeth the Son likewise. So the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. In other words, Jesus the Son was allowing the Father to make every move in that chess game. And there was not one time that he, that he ever, that he varied from that. The Father made every single move without question. Notice verse 30. I can in my own self do nothing as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Now look at John chapter 8, verse 28. I'm going to show you a few of these tonight. Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am he and that, the, and that I do nothing of myself. But if my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Now if Jesus... Now, this is just a question. Now, if Jesus, when he walked upon this earth, was our model, our example of how to live, and he was dependent upon the Father for every move he made, how arrogant is us 
to think we can do it by ourselves. I mean, if Jesus was walking on this line and he realized that he had to surrender his will to the Father's will in every area, how arrogant is us to think that we can do our will and do it our way and everything be okay? That seems ridiculous, don't it? You see, beloved, in, 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 in mankind, there's a pride and an arrogancy about us. That we think we can handle this by ourselves. There's a pride and an arrogancy in our lives that would hinder us from being a people of prayer. Because if we were as dependent upon the Father as Jesus was, then we would have the prayer life that Jesus had. If I realize how much I'm dependent on everything with, with God, if I realize, you know, how truly helpless I am in life without the hand of God moving, then I'm going to not hesitate to commit everything in my life to prayer. You see, brother, that's the one thing that God is speaking to me so much about lately and, and just pounding upon me. It, 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 it's just the finest details of life. I need to be committing to prayer. There should be a detail in my life that's not been saturated in prayer. I don't care how large, how small. If I'm truly humble before God, and I truly realize that I'm absolutely 100% helpless to do anything in this situation without the hand of God moving, then the only logical place for me to be is in a prayer closet on my face before God. There's nothing in my life that should not be made into prayer. Nothing. And nothing in our lives that shouldn't be saturated in prayer. If we're truly a humble people, if we're truly surrendered to Him, humble means to bend the knee into subjection. It's just submission to God. It's just submission to Him. You know, so often we, we associate that with salvation. You know, we give our salvation testimonies and when we came to the Lord, and you know, you've heard me share mine. And, and usually there's something in that account that brought us to a place of humility. Usually there's something that was in our life at that time that we, we had a Goliath that we couldn't defeat. We had a problem we couldn't, we couldn't overcome. Something in our life that had been a, a sin or a drugs and alcohol, what have you, and whatever it might have been, there was something in our life that just brought us to our knees, so to speak, and brought us to that place of humility that we realized we need God. We need Christ. And we're born again at that point in time. But then again, if you listen to our testimony, we'll find out that a lot of times along the way we run into other things like that, don't we? And for some reason, as human beings, we seem to want to want to just want, we want to just kind of come and surrender to God and to get up off the altar and try to do it ourselves and, and realize we, we run into a wall and surrender to God and get up and try again for ourselves for a while and surrender to God and get up and try it for ourselves for a while. We seem to like going through that cycle quite a bit. But beloved, we've got to understand the place of humility is where we come to God, bow that knee in submission to Him, and rely upon Him and depend upon Him entirely and completely all the time. You see, that, that, that scripture is not talking about a one-time event. He said, if you humble yourself, he's not saying, just take a minute here, humble yourselves, act pitiful. And, and, and God, there, there are certain religions that do that kind of thing. And they have certain ceremonies that, that make you, that, that you do to remind yourself you're pitiful. That's not what that's talking about. That's talking about coming to a place of, of submission to God's will. At a place of humility where we realize that we are absolutely helpless without Him. In every area of life. And, and, and that person is going to be a prayerful person. That, that, that person is going to see God's face. That person is going to be quick to turn away from wicked ways. Because if I'm entirely dependent upon Him, and I'm entirely relying upon Him. You see, beloved, when we understand that place, then we're quick to turn away from wicked ways. I remember again talking about prayer journals, reading in the journals that were written by George Mueller, and George Mueller was the man in, in England who, who wanted to prove to the world that just through prayer he could feed uh, multitudes of orphans. And so he opened up these orphanages and, and began to just commit his life to prayer and to prove that God would provide for those orphans just strictly through his prayers. And, and one of the great miraculous stories in the history of Christianity, and it's not only phenomenal that those orphans were fed, but if you trace the history of those orphans, I mean, there was a, an explosion of missionaries that came out of England at that time, and many of them were connected directly to that orphanage. And many of them had come from there. 
But I remember reading in his journal when he would talk about how, you know, the Bible says that if we regard iniquity in our heart, that God won't hear us. I remember him talking about how he had to be so before God and, and living a pure life and a holy life and, and the slightest little sin, he would have to quickly run and repent because he realized that, that, that those orphans were dependent upon his prayer life. And if he's wrong, they don't read. So he was a humble man. Quick to repent. Quick to turn away from anything that might hinder his prayer life. You see, beloved, if we, if we really understood how much we're really dependent, whether or not we see it or not, upon our prayer life, we would be quick to get rid of anything that might hinder it. We would be quick to turn away from our wicked ways if we were truly humble in our dependence upon the Lord. You see, it's amazing how all of these things are so directly connected to humility. You see, that's the great battle of Christianity. Do you know where sin was born? Sin was born in the heart of Satan. And sin was born in the heart of Satan by pride. Ezekiel 28 tells us that, that he began to be lifted up because of his own beauty. He began to look at himself and think he was fine. The Bible says that he began to, to say, I will exalt myself. I'll, I'll be like the Most High. I'll lift my throne above the Most High's throne. And he began to try to exalt himself and became intoxicated with himself. And then he tried to spread the poison. Then he came into the garden of Eden and said, Shh, Eve, come here. If you eat of that tree, you'll be like a god. And spread that poison of pride. You see, well, the greatest enemy to Christianity is pride. The birthplace of all sin is pride. And you know that scripture that says pride cometh before a fall? That's true. How many of y'all have proven that with your life? Ever get really proud about yourself? Kaboom! It happens, doesn't it? Amen. You see, it stems all the way back to our salvation. Remember the parable I was teaching about the Pharisee and the tax collector? The Pharisees of one patting himself on the back. Oh, I thank you, I'm not like others. I thank you, like I pay my tithes and I fast and I do all this stuff. He's really tooting his horn. And the other was the one that was humble, realizing that he was dependent upon the mercy seat or dependent upon the blood of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, which one was justified? Obviously not the proud one, but obviously the one who put his faith in the mercy seat. When we see that example over and over in Scripture, remember Peter? The one who said, Lord, others may deny you, but not me. Lord, I can die for you. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, we're the cock crows three times. You deny me. Get back. Peter's about to go, come. Boom! Pride. Come up before the fall. You see, beloved, that's the great enemy of Christianity. Remember the rich young ruler, how he came? <laughs> Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus kept around with all some of the commandments. Well, I've got that since my youth. Really? I've always found it interesting Jesus didn't challenge him on that. You know? He said, well, okay, then you'll be perfect. Then just go sell all that you have to give to the poor. Then he walked away. Grieving. You see, he was proud, wasn't he? He was proud that he had lived a religious life and kept the commandments. Pretty proud about all his wealth, probably, too. I often wondered, and I've looked at that, 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 that example, and it's really no indication. But I've often wondered if, if, if maybe the big issue was not letting go of the money, but giving to the poor. I would wonder if maybe his nose was up here a little bit. You know, there's a lot of people who really like to look down on the poor. They gosh, they get what they deserve. You know, they're where they're at because of the choices they made. I wonder if maybe that was the issue in his heart. Maybe he was a little proud of there. See, brother, pride is the great enemy of Christianity. Pride, whether we realize it or not, is 
the great enemy of our walk with God. Pride is a great enemy of our prayer life. But that's a can for a second. Pride is a great enemy of our prayer life. Because we think that we can handle it. See, that's why sometimes it's difficult to pray about the small things in life. Well, I don't want to bother God with this. I can handle this. That's what pride says. But if we're like Jesus, we're looking to serve his will every step of the way. Pride is a tremendous enemy to revival, to prayer, to everything about the things of God. You know, we, we look at the scriptures. Speaking of pride. Uh, we look at the scriptures. And, and we see the life of Jesus. And, and the life of Jesus, I, I can read you a multitude of scriptures on that. And, and I probably won't read all of them tonight. But a multitude of scriptures where Jesus was always 100% surrendered to doing the will of the Father, wasn't he? I mean, there was never a time that Jesus did anything other than the will of the Father. Everything he did was designed to do the will of the Father. Now, a lot of times, we as believers don't live that way. A lot of times, we make our decisions by what we want. Right? Now, think about this for a moment. We're going somewhere. There's a lot of times that we get up tomorrow, and we think, Lord, I'm going to, we go, <clears throat> and we just kind of do what we want to do, right? There's a lot of times that, that people live their lives, even Christian people, and we do in life what we want to do. We live where we want to live. We act the way we want to act, so to speak. We, we have the activities in our life are determined by what we want, not necessarily by what God wants. We're not necessarily at a point of surrender to what the Father wills. You see, beloved, there is a tremendous arrogance when we place our purposes above God's. Think about this for a moment. God's purposes upon this planet are eternal purposes. Our fleeting little moments and little decisions and little desires seem pretty small compared to God's eternal purposes, don't they? I mean, when Jesus surrendered his life to do the Father's will, when Jesus surrendered his life to do the Father's purposes, and we think we can decide what we want to do with our lives, seems kind of arrogant to me. The, the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world. God's eternal purposes that he's doing right now is to call out the people to be called by his name. He's, he's spreading the gospel across this planet. And his whole desire and design is to, is to lead people to Christ. So if the purposes and designs of our life are not surrendered to his purposes, then that seems to me kind of silly, silly doesn't it? If I'm just here, and I'm living on this planet, and I'm living my life according to what I want, and according to my desires and my designs, and I'm not truly humble enough to submit my life to God's purposes, and God's designs, and God's plans, is that humility? Doesn't humility come to God and say, Lord, let not my will, but thine be done? Doesn't humility say, God, I know that your purposes are eternal, and you're here to save and redeem a lost people, and somewhere or another, God, I have a purpose and a plan, and I'm part of that. I'm a vessel in that, Lord God. God, show me what your will is. Show me what your purpose is. Show me what your plan is. Not what I want to do. You know, we all grew up through school, and everybody said, well, what do you want to do with your life? Maybe God has to teach you to say, what does God want you to do with your life? What's God's will for your life? What's God's plan for your life? What's God's purpose for your life? I mean, if I had my will for my life when I was young, I'd have been playing shortstop for the New York Yankees. It didn't work out. Everybody said, you got the short part now. But when I was a kid, that was my... Dream and desire. I want to play professional baseball. And the Yankees was my favorite team, and shortstop was my favorite position, so I want to play shortstop for the Yankees. I think someday I'll be there in Yankee Stadium playing baseball. Everybody, ooh. But you know what? God had other plans for my life. God 
God has other purposes for my life. And what we got to do is we've got to ask God, what's your plan for my life, Lord? What's your purpose for my life, Lord? What do you want me to do today, God? What's your desires for me, Lord? Because Jesus was always surrendered to the will of the Father. If we humble ourselves, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. If we humble ourselves, you know, it, it, it's kind of funny when you think about things. And when we really sit for a moment and dwell upon things, what do we have to boast about? In all honesty, what do we have to boast about in life? And, and that's kind of what 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 brings to our attention. For who maketh these to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Now, put that in our common terms. How many of you know who LeBron James is? <coughs> Do I know who LeBron James is? NBA player? Okay. Anybody know how tall LeBron James is? You know how tall he is? How tall is he? 6'8". Six, 6'8". How many of you know how, how tall do you think I am? 5'8". 5'8". 5'8 and a half are really good today. <laughs> now, me and LeBron James are out here. And we're going to do a jump ball. And how do you know what a jump ball is? <coughs> I am. Throw the ball up. <laughs> Try to swipe your teammate. We're going to do a jump ball. How many of you think I do? Why would we be proud about what we can do? 
when God gave us the ability to do it. You see, beloved, there's all kinds of reasons to be humble. There's not many reasons we can find to be proud. Hallelujah. Everybody can't sing like I can sing. I know that.
He knew what we was doing. He'd been to the drill himself. But in the world, we, we do things to honor men. And in the world, a lot of times, we seek things. We seek honor. We want to be honored. We want to be a people to look at and say, oh, look at what they've done. We want the applause and the cheers. Jesus didn't want that. He didn't want a reputation in this world to where when he came on the scene, oh, Jesus is here. He never saw it earthly honor. He's our model of humility. He only had one concern, and that was to do the will of the Father. And if we honored him, we honored him. If we didn't, we didn't. But he was just there to do the will of the Father. Now the fact the disciples remember them. The disciples said, well, Jesus, we... I, I did the biggest thing I did when the disciples came and said, and I said, Jesus, who's the greatest? You're asking Jesus who the greatest is. Because that qualifies a tough question. Very much. Was it the mother came and says, uh, prayer to my sons, one to sit on the right hand, one to sit on the right hand. They were seeking honor. They were wanting to be honored. They wanted, when they got in eternity, to, to be on the right hand of Jesus, on the left hand of Jesus. So everybody could applaud and say, oh, look at what they've done. Jesus wasn't seeking that. And I wonder if I could be seeking honor. Are we seeking to do the will of the Father? Because much of what's done in this world is done to seek honor. Amen. Much of what's done in this world is done to seek honor. I mean, there, there's about three motivating forces in this world. Honor is one of them. Power is the other. Money is the other. That's what drives this world, doesn't it? That greed and that power and that desire for that honor and that applause. But Jesus never sought that. So if my people humble themselves and stop seeking world and the honor and just simply seek to do the will of the Father, if my people humble themselves and, and realize how dependent they are upon, upon Christ and Him crucified and upon our prayer life, then it's easy to see how all of these things kind of fall in place. If we're only seeking to do the will of the Father, then obviously we're going to be seeking His face, aren't we? We're going to be seeking to know what His, what his desires is, what His will is. We're going to be seeking Him every in the finest details of life. Lord, what do you want me to do today? Lord, how do you want me to do this? Seeking constantly his leadership and his guidance and, and the understanding of his word. You see, if we get this humble ourselves part right, all the other things kind of fall in place. Hallelujah. Just like Jesus. When he, at the Last Supper, when he took the worst face and got down and washed the feet of the disciples, they became a servant. Was seeking no honor, but to do the will of the Father. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now I'm not concluding with this. 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. Peter chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. And here, here's the result of that. <coughs> Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Well, I want God's grace. I certainly don't want to be proud and have God resist me. Certainly don't want God fighting against me. Verse 6 Humble yourselves. Therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that may he may exalt you in due time. You know, there, there's a, a, a thing that sometimes I think we, we, we miss here. And people say, well, this is just happening in life because God's trying to humble me. The Bible tells us to humble ourselves. I mean, God wanted to humble us. I mean, he's, you know, I mean, that. <laughs> you know, humble. Okay, Lord. But the Bible tells us, in, in, in many places, to humble ourselves. So this is something we do to really stopping and considering some of the things I'm talking about and realizing our absolute dependence upon God. 
We are as dependent upon God as the, as, as the flower is that grows. We're absolutely 100% dependent. And, and I keep coming back to that. And like I said, that's one of the things the Lord is just speaking to me so much about. If I truly understand my right relationship with Him, and I truly understand how in that right relationship the kingdom of God operates, then I'm going to, to be recognizing that total dependence upon Him in my prayer life. And I'm going to be saturating the finest details of my life in prayer. And you know what, beloved? I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times we forget to do that, I think. You know, we get in the car and drive across town and maybe don't pray. Or whatever, the fine details of life. Everything should be saturated in prayer that we do in life. If we truly understand the humble place and the place of humility that we should walk in, then we're going to be constantly looking to the Lord to be dependent upon Him in every detail of our life and our prayer life. That's what the Bible is talking about when it says pray without ceasing. I used to read that and think, what do you mean pray without ceasing? Well, if we're dependent upon Him in every detail, then we're going to be praying without ceasing, aren't we? Everything commit to God in prayer. All things commit to God in prayer. That's where humility brings us. To that place of, Lord, I, whatever I'm doing today, I need to commit that activity to prayer. Whatever my concerns are in my heart about this person or that person, I need to commit that to prayer. Whatever troubles are in my heart, I need to commit that to prayer. What, what, what I know God has is, is been desiring to see happen in your life as your pastor, I need to commit that to prayer. Whatever it is. Everything. Everything. Because I'm entirely and you're entirely dependent upon Him in all things. So we need to pray about all things. If my people humble themselves, prayer will follow. Seeking His face will follow. And turning from our wicked ways will follow. Those three happen normally and naturally as we come to that place of humility. And that's why that order is there. Humble yourselves first. A humble man or a humble woman is a praying man or a praying woman. A humble man or a humble woman is a, is a person who's seeking his face. A humble man or a humble woman is one who's quick to turn away from sin and wicked ways. Amen? Amen. 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 Again, come humbly to the keyboard. <laughs>